that's going to be showing how you can uh, program Haskell programs in Kotlin. Yep, that's uh, pretty much it. Maybe we should turn this on. This is on. And the server field that's a new, a new switch. Is this on? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, thanks Mr. for the introduction. Uh, so I'm going to talk about X monad in cock. So there's two words you may or may not have heard of in the title. So the first one's cock. So I know you're all Haskell programmers, so I'm going to assume zero knowledge of cock. So for the purpose of this talk, let's assume that cock is just a total function of programming language. And um, there's a process which I'll call extraction, which lets you generate um, OCaml or Haskell or Steam from, uh, from cock programs. And if you have heard about pulp, you know there might be proofs lying around. All these proofs are kind of thrown away by the extraction process. So I want to give a 30 second demo. I don't have much time, but um, here's the file I prepared. So this is a call file. Uh, you can load things uh, into call kind of interactively. So here I've defined an inductive data type for this. And you can define a pen. You can see there's some kind of pattern matching going on. And define some nice notation to work. Okay, I mean, it's just a functional programming language, it's no different than what you're used to. Interestingly, you can also do proofs if you want, so uh, here's a proof, but this talk really isn't about doing proofs. I just want to admit this and leave uh, all the proofs, let's forget about the proofs for a moment. What else can you do? Well, this is the extraction part. So if you give some magical commands to call and say, give me a uh, Haskell extraction, for the append function, what you get is this little file here. Cox spits that out. And it looks kind of like Haskell code, right? Maybe not handwritten Haskell code, but you can see that it's really doing the append on two lists. So that's amazing technology, right? Yet, extraction to Haskell is not popular. So the Cox developments of functional programs that have been uh, successful, I'd say, Mostly all target OCaml, because the OCaml um, is much more similar to the COG functional programming language, which is called Go, uh, than Haskell. So, part of this experiment, I call it experiment maybe, not an experience report, is trying to do something serious with COG extraction to Haskell. So, let's start with XMonad. That's the other word in the title that you may or may not have heard of. So, what's XMonad? So, XMonad is a tiling window manager for and what that means is it just helps you arrange the windows on your desktop. And it kind of plasters them over the whole screen. Um, it's written and configured in Haskell. And what's interesting is it has about tens of thousands of users. So it's really non-trivial code. It, I mean, by approximation, it's the only Haskell program anyone really cares about. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a screenshot, right? And you can do things, you can lay out to the windows in this nice kind of spiral layout, and it's the kind of things nerds like us love to use. So a little bit about the design behind this one. It's really well designed. I mean, it was written by Don Stewart. He had a presentation at the Haskell Symposium a few years ago about it. And he had a picture which was kind of like this. He said, we started off with a pure functional core, and that's where we have our little model. We, um, we, we model all the windows and, the, and the, the screens and the monitors and all of that everything your window manager needs to know about. And around that, we kind of wrap some, some, some monads, and then we have the IO monad, and all the communication with the evil X server kind of happens at the very, very last part. So, what I've done in this paper. So this paper describes a re-implementation of the kind of the red circle you saw on the previous slide, uh, which is the pure core of X monad, and I re-implemented it, it in Kong. And I just, that's, that was not even the hard part. The hard part was getting extraction set up so that I could have a drop-in replacement for the original COG, for the original Haskell file. And then in the paper, you can read about my experience. So, does it work? Um, yeah, it does, but it was... <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, what happens in the functional core? I, I, I don't really want to go over, through it too deeply, but I can give you kind of a, a slight taste. So basically, it's um, just a Haskell module. It's a thousand lines, give or take, um, and it defines zippers. It defines zippers, but kind of nested and nested. So the idea is here, this is a circular zipper with non-empty lists, and there's some strictness annotations. Um, and th this is basically what you can think of doing 
alt tab, alt tab, alt tab on the on when you kind of navigate to the next um, application, right? This is the kind of structure that you might use to represent that. So this is kind of the very very simplest data type. On top of this, they stack kind of uh, what does your window look like? What does your desktop look like? What do your workspaces look like? How many monitors do you have? All of that information is also in there. So on top of all these data types, there are various functions which allow you to manipulate uh, these differs. So you can kind of go to the next window or the previous window or swap around or tile them slightly differently. And uh, that's it. So it's a pretty small file. And I thought it shouldn't be too hard to write this out into it, right? So uh, it's not too hard. So the good news is, um, I said prop was a total simply typed functional language, which means I can't use general recursion, and I have to be really careful in pattern matching. So I have to take care that when I pattern match on a data type, I pattern match it on every constructor and give a sensible result in every case. So here's a, a kind of fragment of a function from the X minus sources. And this is when, you, uh, when you're navigating one of these zippers and you want to move left, and you have nothing to the left of you and you're at position X and you have these guys to the right. So the idea is that you do this columns here and you reverse that and then you have your, uh, your new zipper which is built up like this. But there's a caveat here in that this pattern match might fail, right? I mean, um, we know it won't fail because if you reverse a non-empty list, you always get a non-empty list now. But, you know, try turning that to call. Okay, then the extraction. Ah, oh, this is where they have extracted. Okay, if you do the basic extracted code, you get kind of what I showed you for the list example. And it's pretty terrible. So it uses piano numbers instead of machine integers. It uses extracted crop booleans instead of like Haskell bool. Um, it uses extract, so it extracts all your data types. So it's generate it's, its own version of um, uh, all these zipper data types, whereas kind of the rest of the XMonad library kind of um, expects uh, these zippers to have a certain shape and the records to have certain uh, constructors and all of that. So it's, it won't work if you just use the extracted code. And more generally, it generates pretty non idiomatic Haskell lines. Okay, so what can we do? This is the good news. Um, there's lots of hooks which you can use to customize extraction. So you can tell it uh, to inline certain functions, Maybe you postulated certain axioms which you want to realize with built-in Haskell functions. So you can do that. Or you can uh, convert uh, to built-in Haskell data types instead of using the extracted uh, cock data types. So here's a small example of that. So suppose you want to use um, kind of real Haskell rules. So this is what you write. So what this says is that you want to um, replace the cock bool type by the Haskell capital bool type and that the first constructor of bool goes to the Haskell constructor true, and that the second constructor for bool, for little bool, goes to the Haskell constructor false. So what could possibly go wrong here, right? <laughs> um, okay, so you can kind of see that there's plenty of opportunity here to shoot yourself in the foot. Okay, so if we want better extracted code, um, what can we do? There's another problem which arises, in that, so you, you you have this problem, uh, this is another camel specific thing. Um, the extracted file, it uses generated data types, I already said that, and it exports everything that you define in your module, which is not what you want. So in your camel, that's another problem, because there you can have a separate header file which says exactly what the interface is to your file, but maybe you want to keep certain definitions hidden, and then in Haskell, you do that by having a separate module header which says what are the kind of things you want to export from this module. So what's our solution? Um, so we can use uh, this trick I just showed you to customize extraction and then use hand-coded data types. And where do these hand-coded data types, types come from? Well, we use a standard theorem proving trick, which is we use a script language called SED, <laughs> and we splice in a new module header saying exactly what we want to export, and it has the data type definitions from the original XMLF file. And we just kind of copy those over it and use the um, cop extraction to target those guys. Okay, great solution, right? Tight classes, I have another headache. So if you look at Haskell, and suppose I was going to write an LM function in Coq, and I wanted to export that, and I wanted to generate a function which I verify or prove something about. Uh, what you typically write in Haskell is you give it a type signature like this, 
which has this EQ A constraint, which says which you need to do the uh, comparison between the elements of the list. So a Cork user might write something like this, which you don't have to understand. But the bottom line is, um, if you extract function, if you uh, extract that function, you get a slightly different function because you you parameterize by an extra argument, which is basically the dictionary, which you now need to pass in explicitly. So there's a solution, which is that um, along with the other stuff you splice in with the set script, you splice in some wrapper uh, functions here, which call the um, the 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 extracted call functions um, with the with the right argument. So you're passing in the equality function explicitly. Okay, what else goes wrong? Okay. Um, this trick it doesn't scale very well. If you have bigger type classes like ORD or integral, and there are a few examples like this in the X one of sources, um, you have to end up passing around lots and lots of files. And if you look at the, um, the kind of original XMONAD implementation of these zippers, it's super generic. It's a little bit too generic. They kind of say, we'll label um, all our windows with a unique identifier, which will be integral, although they only ever specialize it to integral. So I had to cheat a little bit and change the XMONAD sources and specialize that because I didn't want to keep passing around these dictionaries. If you want to exist, uh, uh, interface with existing libraries, that's uh, really annoying. Uh, typically, what you do in COP is you can either postulate their existence, but then if you want to prove anything about these functions, you need to kind of postulate more lemmas about them. You don't know if those guys are true, and so forth and so forth. And so you end up writing more set script to post process the generative Haskell uh, code some more. And that's all. I mean, uh, there is a result here, which, uh, which is quite fabulous. So if you run extraction, you end up with um, a drop and replacement. It passes the quick check suite. It, um, just runs, it looks fine, it seems entirely stable, uh, and you, you have a result. You, um, you actually prove that the core functions from the XMOMED library, is that they're total, they won't crash, or that's not quite true, kind of, there's some preconditions that you might assert, like saying, um, if you call this function, you should be sure that the number you call it with, with is bigger than five. Now these proofs get erased, and your code might still fail dynamically, but at least you've made it very explicit what kind of assumptions you're making. And we fixed the bug, bug in X1 by doing this. So that's, um, that was good. Uh, and then more than, I'd say, a corner of the quick check properties, which, uh, which X1 had defines, I've actually verified it well. I kind of lost interest at that point, I have to say. Um, it's, uh, just doing the proofs in call is something we kind of know how to do. This was more an experiment in seeing how we could use uh, verified Haskell code in a real project. And it's all on GitHub, so you can check it out and have a look. So, what are the conclusions of this experiment? So, one thing I learned was I think that formal verification, um, at least with the technology we have today, it can complement uh, but not replace a good test suite. I really needed the XMONAC uh, quick check tests during the development of the COP file, because what I typically do is I'd start, um, I'd run my extraction, then I'd run the quick check test, and I saw I, I, I either made a mistake with the translation from Haskell to Cog, or I'd done some other silly mistake. And um, so the type system and the quick check tests really helped me debug this. It would have been really hard without this. And this was a surprise to me. I used to think, well, ah, if you prove something in Cog, then you know it's true once and for all. But if you use it, want to use it in any kind of real software system, you, uh, you're going to get bugs if you're not careful. And the final lesson is, uh, today's technology, maybe not so mature. If you need uh, kind of scripts like said to fix your extracted code, then something might be wrong. And further research might be worth it. So, uh, on that note, I'd like to take questions. Thank you very much.